muscles would start twitching, you know? I'm so uh, uh, focused, nervous, but excited. <laughs> when you hit the stage and start playing and you look them in the eye, <laughs> dude, it's over, man. That is, that's the ultimate drug, the ultimate drink, the ultimate feeling. And we're addicted to it. You're listening to URN Radio for Nottingham. It's what And tonight sees the return of thrash metal legends Metallica. play when we fire up together and we have that audience there's something happens you get these four sticks of dynamite together i mean you know it's just the result is obvious <laughs> it's a magical experience it's all about the music and the performance and giving it your all Singing. It's a shared experience. They're chanting, hey, hey, come on. That's where the connection happens. It's not us and them, it's all of us together. I'm like, going, yeah, we love this song. We feed off the audience, the audience feeds off us. I'm like, yeah, I love this song too. So it just goes to like a whole different place. A giant feeding frenzy of metal. first time I really felt the roar of the crowd, it wasn't, I wasn't on stage. It was uh, before I actually started playing guitar. I got hooked by it when I went to see concerts. Thin Lizzy, Winterland, 1977. Like 78, Aerosmith, ACDC, Long Beach Arena. In LA, there was a band called Seagull. I'd watch them play, you know, at the local theater. My senses got pounded with everything from smell the energy to the sounds the mystery and the lights i was just so blown away it made me feel alive it made me feel a part of something i couldn't get over the fact that the guys that were on stage were the guys who were on the cover of the album who i listened to every single day yeah, i was so inspired by what i saw that i'd go home and i'd practice i wanted to be the dude that was in my posters hanging up in my room i would imagine myself being john paul jones or geezer butler or getty lee so i was hooked right then Sunday night, Radio City, Anaheim, California. Our first gig ever. Little rock virgins, I don't know what else to call it. So basically called everybody we could to get in there. There was a good 75 to 100 people. It's pretty amazing for a first gig for anybody. That was the most people we had for probably the next uh, two years. <laughs> it slowly dwindled after that. Well, after the first note, it kind of, people started leaving, I think. <laughs> we go up and we open up with Hit the Lights. Hit the lights, the lights. I think the first song, uh, Dave Broke a String. We had not anticipated something like that. Dave Mustaine took what seemed like forever <laughs> and five minutes on top of that to change his guitar string. <laughs> I was sitting up on stage trying to sort of duck behind the drums. That's when it hit me. You have to be prepared for anything that's gonna happen. It was not exactly how I planned out my first uh, live experience. That first show with them, I was nervous as, as you can believe. Uh, it was in Dover, New Jersey sometime in April 1983. The week previous to that, I had gotten their No Life Till Leather demo and was told to learn 
all, you know, all the songs. Think back on the, the early years, it was just, it was strange because a lot of the stuff we were doing was so, so complicated. They can tell that I was nervous. I mean, I was, it was just literally shaking in, in my shoes. It was like, you went on stage, play a gig to, to deliver a, a, a performance and the objective was to not f up. And I, I remember doing a really, really good job until the, the encore. By the time we got to motor breath, James was pretty drunk. <laughs> and <laughs> Lars was playing it faster than we'd ever played it. I'm lost. I don't know where the hell I, I am. Oh my god, what's coming next? Don't f up. Oh shit, somebody's gonna yell at me. Ah! Two thirds of the way through the song, James looked at me and just said, gave me this look. And I thought, oh my god, it's curtains. This is the end. I remember saying to Lars, hey, I'm sorry I screwed up that part in, in, in Motor Breath. And he said, don't worry, it was a great first show for you. It can only get better from here. I don't think it was until much later that, uh, and I mean much later, not the next week, I'm talking years, that it got to a point where um, you were relaxed enough to actually enjoy the gigs. <laughs> Relive the music on. What goes really good with the new stuff is old stuff. I remember we started young. I was uh, 19 when we went on our first tour. And, and, and you know, I, you know, none of us had a lot of, of life experiences. We have a debut album out on Megaforce Records. It's called Kill Em All. We're glad to kill all you tonight. It was a gang of kids out on the road. We would put all our equipment in the U-Haul and sleep in the back of the U-Haul. You know, sleep in with the U-Haul blankets. Your body would leap up every time you went over like a bump or something. It was just horrendous. Over like three or four hours, our, our bodies would just kind of like vibrate to the back and then we'd all get up and move forward and it would just vibrate to the back. It was all about survival. Needless to say, we didn't ever get much sleep. In the very early days, we would all four be in the same hotel room. Half of us would run to claim a bed. I got the, the bed. And the other half would, would run into the bathroom. You should call first shower. I got shower first. Second shower, third shower. <laughs> there were some hotels where we'd have to share towels. The rules were no ass wiping. Yeah. You were sleeping <laughs> together. No jerking off while the other guy was lying next to you. You could have a girl there. There is always someone else in the bed with us. <laughs> but no self-relief. Go to the bathroom, for God's sake. It wasn't until the Ride the Lightning tour that we actually got a, a, a tour bus. There is always the unspoken law of don't <laughs> on the bus. <laughs> you know, slinging the towel in there, you know, to... to drop your load and then kind of take it. It's like this adult diaper. <laughs> what am I doing with this? I remember Cliff did that once and was trying to get rid of it outside the, the bus and there were some fans out there that just had to have it, I guess. <laughs> they were fighting over the, the towel. That was not, not pretty. <laughs> We went through our, you know, beer days. Drink before we go on stage. Our Jaeger days. Drink during. Gin days. Drink after. There was a lot of, a lot of drinking pretty much going on. We were all nerdy, uh, dorky, uh, loner, outcast kids. Basically, we just wanted to get drunk and get laid. <laughs> 12 hours of party and 12 hours of hangover and then 12 hours of party and on it went. You invited everybody from the audience, preferably female on the tour bus. You'd walk out on the tour bus, it'd be like 30, 40 girls sitting there. Like, let's all share this together. And uh, there was a lot of sharing going on. The 
first time that we did arenas in America headlining on the Justice Tour. It was pretty nutty. Party. The summer with Guns N' Roses in 92, it was pretty nutty. Hanging out with the other bands. Touring with them in 93, it was just like a, a wild and crazy circus. Just having a blast. <laughs> they were the first guys to drink a full bottle of Jaeger with me. <laughs> a debaucherous medieval experience on the road. We wouldn't survive those times now. <laughs> no, we can still tie one on if we have to, at least. But obviously, uh, things are not debaucherous, uh, you know, unless, of course, you call a couple people sitting around drinking red wine, but it's so civilized, it's pretty sickening, actually. Um, <laughs> trust me. Do you all know Cliff Burton over here? After the bus accident in Sweden, we were so lost. When you're 21, 22 years old, you're just not equipped to deal with those types of situations. We didn't know what to do. It wasn't about whether to continue or not, so much in my recollection as it was to how to continue. I just started drinking harder. The only way to get through it was to keep going jump in a vodka bottle and keep going. Our management said, the best thing to do is get out on the road and work it out through the music, you know, and we took that advice. I don't think we actually sat and, and weighed the pros and cons of it. And maybe it wasn't the best advice, but that's kind of what we knew. That was our cocoon, that was our safe zone. When we jammed together, the world, everything's okay in the world. You're 21, 22. You don't know anything else. Cliff would have been the first one to give us a kick in the ass and tell us to get out there and stop sulking and, and get on with it because of what he had been part of building. Later on is when all kind of the grieving started happening. And there's still parts of Cliff uh, that uh, I miss very much. Fans, they just take it to a whole nother level. It's great to see you. Did you miss us? You'll go on a European run of shows and you'll see like a handful of uh, fans from the States. You could be in Estonia, you know, or in Moscow, and they're there. And it's amazing to me how die hard and hardcore they are. Come on, Obviously, pretty amazing uh, the amount of people that have grown old with us. There are fans out there that have followed us since '83. I still see familiar faces in the audience that I first started seeing on the Master of Puppets tour. You know, you've grown up together. Only now those faces are a little bit pudgier. <laughs> it's a good feeling that someone still cares. Have a little bit more gray hair or less gray hair. Just the fact that they're still supporting you. Some of these faces now have little kids in tow. Life moves on with Metallica. <laughs> Artist ever. Let the rock madness begin on rockmadness.fuse.tv. There are so many amazing things that we have seen and places that we have gone and played in our lives. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. Ooh. We've seen riots go down in Puerto Rico because we couldn't play. It rained so much. Indonesia, there was flipping police cars over. We've seen, you know, security pull out guns and start firing. Yeah. Yeah. We've played in 
Taktoyaktak, above the Arctic Circle. We met everyone in the town and then played a concert for them in a tent. I remember one of the early shows I had done with them was at the LA Coliseum and being from Southern California and seeing the Rolling Stones there in 1980, all of a sudden, you know, being up on stage with Metallica and just feeling the energy of 60,000 people. And you feel like you're floating at that point. That was one of the most intense moments for me. I remember, you know, walking off the stage in Oakland thinking, I, I just played a day on the green. It was less than five years ago that I was going to these Day on the Greens, just kind of like, you know, seeing the bands and daydreaming. One day I was going to be up there. Thinking, God, I've done something that's made my mother proud of me. <laughs> Moscow, we're having some fun today! We had an experience in Moscow in, um, in 1991, the beginning of the thawing of the, of the Russian, you know, Soviet Union and, and, and that whole thing, and, 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 and things were changing. We played a gig out on an airfield called Toshino Airfield. As far as the eye could see, there was people. There were helicopters that were flying, like, over the crowd. Some say two million, some say, you know, quarter of a million. I'm not talking about, like, little, you know, Channel 4 news copters. I mean, these were big in whatever they're called. Russian soldiers have music enter their body and just look at the fans and go, what am I doing here? They take their hat off and throw down their club and turn around and just start rocking out. This was nutty. It was just unlike anything we'd ever done before and anything we've ever done since. Today, more than ever, I look out there and say, man, I am... I'm a lucky bastard. <laughs> I am, I'm singing in a pretty good band, somewhat known, <laughs> still going strong, got an album that's doing well. We've been together for 20 some odd years. And the fact that we're still out on the road having fun with a positive attitude and getting love back from the audience that inspires us. It's scary how much how much we can feed off that and keep going. You want more? No! No! Oh, well, all right. out of the Metallica concert, I want them to feel content pain. <laughs> There's no escape, and that's for sure. This is the end, we don't take anymore. I want them to feel completely drained of physical energy, mental energy. Their throat is to the point where they can't talk anymore. So take, come on! what you say? So take. them to feel like we feel every night, you know, where we've given it our all and more. Oh, yeah! And when someone leaves, I want them to say, you know what? That's the best concert I've ever seen. And good luck topping that one. Did you have fun tonight? So did we, you beautiful man. We thank you very much. Come with us. Hey, 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 hey. Metallica loves Manchester! What we're doing is so physical that I, I just don't know if we're gonna be able to do it in 20 years. People always, when they talk about longevity, they, they go right to the Rolling Stones. No disrespect, they're not doing what we're doing. It's that simple. They're not headbanging, they're not playing 100 miles an hour songs. Yeah, our, our, our music is a little more intense. I look at Lemmy from Motorhead. He's still up there doing the same thing. I look at someone like Iggy Pop and still out there going crazy. It can be done. We're 45 now and we're still 
being able to throw down. I remember when my dad turned 45, I was like, dude, he was old, like 45 is old. And like, he grew up as a professional tennis player. At 45, you joined the, the seniors tour. I mean, we're out here, we got a machine head opening for us every night, kicking us in the ass. There's no senior tour. I just don't know. I don't know um, if we can do it for another 20 years. And I just hope that we have the good senses to get the out of Dodge if it becomes silly. Cool. Every month, Incoming showcases music's brightest shining stars on Fuse.tv with their latest MP3s, music videos, and exclusive interviews. Here's a sneak peek. Incoming. Asher Raw. The script. Discover the next supernova at incoming on fuse.tv slash incoming.